Dr. Kaustu, thank you for joining us today on Timeless Teachings Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Yana. Good morning. So I can see a very interesting picture on your wall at the background. So can you describe a little bit more what is the meaning of that? This picture is a photograph of um, a Indian god called Hayagriva, which is our family deity. And it is an incarnation of Vishnu. Mm. His form uh, above is a horse head and uh, below is a human form. And he has he's in that photograph with the goddess together because in our tradition, we don't believe that God is male or female. We believe that God is male and female mm -hmm. together as a couple. The divine couple is the God. And this photograph is the photograph of a painting that is in an institute called the Parakala Mata, which is a very old institution in our tradition. It goes back about seven or 800 years old. And uh, it was started by one of our ancestors called Vedanta Deshika. And this God is actually the God of education. So since I'm now in uh, my study room, I have it here. And this photograph is actually something that's very old. It's um, something that was used by my grandfather to do his daily prayers and puja. And, uh, and now I have it uh, after many years. It's, it's still in the original framing. If I turn in the back, you can see the, the rust of uh, the iron and it's quite ancient. Wow. The wood is very simple wood. It's not very fancy. Even the color is a little bit, uh, the black and white is a little bit more like silver now. So time has changed all its qualities, but it's very sacred and precious. Yes, it's interesting. We call our podcast Timeless Teachings. <laughs> so what is time, right? <laughs> and uh, and at the same at the same time, um, I'm just curious to hear a bit more about your upbringing, since you mentioned your grandfather and this uh, lineage, right? So could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? So I'm very blessed to be born in my family, which is uh, part of a tradition that we call the Vinayoga tradition that uh, traces back in a continuous uh, lineage till the 8th century. Wow to a great master called Nath Muni. And we are uh, blood ancestors of this teacher who was in the 8th century. Till that we can trace, of course. But before that, there is a, a non-contiguous lineage because we don't know all the history was not recorded at that time, right? So it goes back to an even more ancient master called Namalwar, who is considered our first ancestor. And uh, he is believed to have been uh, lived around 3,500 years ago. So he is considered our first ancestor. So we are very lucky that we are part of this very ancient ancestry. And um, of course, I am born in uh, this wonderful family and I grew up with uh, my father and mother and uh, two siblings. And also my grandfather and grandmother were alive still when I was born. My grandmother passed away when I was nine and my grandfather was there till I was about 14. And we had a very close relationship with both my grandparents. And growing up in this family has been quite a privilege, but also quite a challenge sometimes because not everybody understands that, you know, very often privilege is not just comfortable, it's also very challenging. For example, um, you know, um, my father and my grandfather, they are very, very great observers. And my, my father especially uh, is also my teacher. So when you think about a normal situation, most yoga students now, they spend a few hours of the day with their teacher in a class and then they are in their own uh, life and they are hidden from the teacher, right? But if you grow up in a house where you are living with the teacher, 
you know, you are under 24-hour surveillance. And in some moments, it's very challenging because <laughs> you are expected to be on your best behavior all the time. You're always being observed, always being watched. And even though my father was very kind and very non-judgmental, it's still a pressure, right? Of course. And and again, another set of challenges, how many people would come to our home? Because in those days, everything was happening at the house. Mm -hmm. So there was never this sense of a private space because everything was always public. So more than my parents, my father or my grandfather observing us or judging us, there were always challenges where some of these outsiders, the students of my father, would come for a short period of time and they kind of um, have opinions and judgments and, and things like that. It can be quite overwhelming, but it can also be a great learning lesson for me because very early on in my life, I realized how people are. It was a very great gift for me, how people are. And again, I have also other challenges because I have a brother who is mentally handicapped. And so uh, my parents had uh, to spend a lot of time taking care of his needs, even though he's elder to me. Uh, so very often, uh, my I was kind of like neglected. Mm. Because I was normal. And as an adult, I can understand these reasons very well. But as a young child, it was very challenging. However, I realized that that's what made me who I am because I'm quite different and quite independent in my life, in my approach, because I was neglected, I was ignored. And I don't say it in a bad way. I was left to do whatever I wanted to. So... I figured out everything by myself. And I think I really always, every day, I do in the morning a gratefulness practice. And I always thank my brother for this because um, it's because my brother was in this situation that I have become the person I have because I've become independent. I have my own mind. And I, I really am a problem solver because I had to solve problems very young on myself. So I'm very grateful. They've all built me to be who I am. Thank you for the sharing. That's uh, very deep, very honest, and very, very vulnerable. So I just think it's like a great also learning to everyone who is listening or watching right now. But whatever, guys, you're going through, um, so any problem is an opportunity, right? And Dr. Kaus took you a beautiful example of that. So <laughs> I always tell my students that there is no problems in life. There is only lessons. If we learn from the problem, it becomes a lesson. If we don't learn from it, it stays a problem. We have to turn around from being a victim to being um, somebody who empowers ourselves and see what we can learn from that and how we can move forward. I always say this. Uh, no decision is perfect, but all decisions have consequences, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We are the products of our actions and of our decisions. And I know that you are in yoga, and I know that you are bringing uh, traditional yoga into the world. And so maybe uh, um, let's start with basic, and once again, look at the definition, what is yoga? Oh, Oh, my God. Um, the word yoga, everybody knows now, if you Google, you will find out, comes from the uh, concept called connection or to link or to join or connect. So my own personal meaning is that it's a way that we can connect with our higher purpose. This is my firm belief. In India, we call this higher purpose what is called dharma. In Buddhism also this word exists, dharma. In Jainism also this word exists, dharma. Maybe the best translation in English is like our higher life purpose. We believe that 
we are not just born for eating enjoying life you know watching movies earning money but actually we are here for a higher life purpose so yoga for me is a set of practices that helps me to first of all identify and embrace my higher purpose because that itself needs some courage and secondly to sustain me to fulfill that higher purpose because we all need help fulfilling a higher purpose is not easy it's challenging we will go through ups and downs we need a healthy body we need a healthy mind we need a healthy state of emotions because these things can change because the higher purpose is not a short term goal it's a long term goal so that's my definition of yoga which is it's a set of practices uh, which include not only body practices but also breathing but also meditation practices lifestyle choices that help me connect deeply with the purpose for which we are here such a beautiful way to describe yoga <laughs> can you give us an example of the higher purpose i know that there are many but so people just understand like what what are we talking about here well for everybody <clears throat> the higher purpose may be different for example my purpose i can talk about my own personal purpose is to transmit the teachings of my tradition which has been very very precious and guiding many people into the next generation so my role in a way is that of a teacher that of a transmitter of sacred knowledge that elevates consciousness for somebody else it could be something to do beautiful art for somebody else it could be to support another purpose because mm. not everybody's higher purpose is to be in the front Mm -hmm. like for example we take a bulb the the purpose of the bulb is to shine light but that bulb cannot shine without it being held by a bulb holder so the purpose of the holder is to hold that light so there are some people who need to be in the front but there will be some others whose purpose maybe to be behind supporting those who are in the front and this is something we should accept not every dharma is fashionable or to be in the spotlight you know not all great artists for example are great art teachers mm -hmm. not great mathematicians need not be mathematics teachers so just because we are good in something it doesn't mean automatically we are good about everything in that thing i may not be the best practitioner of yoga but i am certainly not a bad teacher of yoga so these are some examples the the the, the purpose is within our nature it's within our true nature we cannot change it it's what we are born with it's inherent in us it's like part of our seed potential such um you just speak so beautifully dr kaustov i'm listening and i love words you know i i come from a family uh, where people um really connected to the language and <laughs> so to me when i you know meet people who really know how to speak and each words um counts and conveys the message so i'm sort of i'm having like a poetic experience right now <laughs> i'm i'm very happy to hear that but this is also perhaps the blessings of lord hayagriva because hayagriva is the god of the god of speech and words and poetry so it's maybe that's why uh, his blessings are helping me to do my dharma this is what i believe it's not necessarily me but the blessings that i have yeah from that's the lineage, yes from ancestors and from the gods of course 
And you are as a person who are coming from the lineage, as you said, um, living now in a modern world and seeing a lot of modern ways of yoga. <laughs> and, um, so I'm just curious, how, what do you think about it or how do you feel about that? Um, <laughs> it's a tricky question. <laughs> uh, you, it's just using the word yoga. But it's not really yoga because yoga is a very marketable word today. So everybody is using that word to sell something. And it's a, it's, it's a fashion thing. And hopefully time will, will change it. So when you look at the market of yoga today, for example, you have things like uh, dog yoga, hot yoga, uh, whatever yoga, and things like that. You go 20 years ago, they were not there. There was some other yoga like power yoga, uh, ashtanga yoga, etc. They were popular 20 years ago. You go 40 years ago, maybe even this was not there. It was more like the Iyengar yoga and things like that. But if you go 100 years ago, this Ayengar yoga was also not there. If you go 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, 1000 years ago, it wasn't there. But what's been there all throughout is our tradition, Vini Yoga. Even though we are not in the front, we, were, we are always sustained. And that is our goal. We are not here to get distracted by who is more famous or who is not. But our goal is to be the most sustainable tradition because that is what is useful for humanity in the long term. I'm just wondering how does it reflect uh, the state of the current society, especially in the last like 20, 30 years where everything is about instant gratification, instant fame, instant popularity, and at least what I know is just looking around that there is an entire generation of people and also, I mean, people who are their parents, because they also lived through this, that lost a big element of grounding and connection with the, with the earth, with the reality, like, with, you know, with, with the more traditional maybe values. And I'm just curious to hear how you feel about it. I think we are in the dark era. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, because, you know, of all that you have said, we are now in an era where people are consumers. They are not enjoyers. They are just consumers. They buy things. They don't enjoy it. They buy not only product, but also information, experiences. It's all very what you what you rightly said, uh, instantaneous, like instant gratification. Nothing stays forever. Like, look, that photograph behind me, that's been there with our family for 60, 70 years. It's a photograph of a painting. Most people now take photographs on their phone and they don't even remember what photos they took. Mm -hmm. So... The situation is we are in a dark era where we are not rooted. But I don't look at it as completely a bad time. I feel this is the best time for people like us who are working to help people find light because it's only in darkness that people are searching for light. So there are many, many people now who are opening their eyes saying, well, we've got money, we got wealth, we got so many products, but we still are not happy. We are still not finding what we are searching for. So they are opening their eyes and they are searching. <clears throat> Perhaps because of the pattern they have of buying products, buying information, they're also now buying things like this yoga, or that yoga, or this spirituality or that spirituality because spirituality has become a business now. But I think slowly, slowly, 
as one of my English students always tells me, the cream will rise to the top. That's why I believe in what is sustainable because eventually what is of good quality will sustain. What is of good quality will definitely sustain. Everything else will disappear. I have no doubts about this. Look, we are talking about yoga. That's a tradition that started 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Still valuable today. Buddhism, still valuable today. Even Christianity started so many years ago. Still valuable today. Is Jane Fonda still popular? The young people don't even know who that is. So all the fads will disappear, but what will sustain is what will remain forever, which is of good quality. I believe in this. You know, just uh, yesterday, I um, I went to walk my dog <laughs> with my mom in Singapore. <laughs> and we were passing by this place that says uh, a coffee place from 1932. Amazing. And, and they kept uh, like the interior, you know, there, they kept the furniture. And there was so much energy and charm and peace and grounding in this place. And, and it just reminded me of the society moves so fast with progress and technology right now. So it's even more important at the moment to start preserving traditions and, and um, teachings and places, perhaps, right, that have been there for a very long time. Because when it is gone and disappeared, there's no point of reference, not only for the next generation, but even people of this generation can forget within 10, 20, 30 years what happened. Correct. Yeah. I, I think roots are very important. That's what is the tradition. The roots are very important. And, you know, for you, I mean, someone who is coming from a family like that, right? So you come from a very grounded family with very deep roots, which is probably an exception in the modern world. People move from place to place. Children often go to school in different countries when they grow up so they don't have childhood friends because they keep moving right what can you advise to people that they can do to find that balance and grounding well i'm 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 sure that these changes happen only in the last 40 50 years not that, before that's correct <laughs> So I don't feel that all is lost. I feel optimistic because I see some younger people now going back to roots. I feel there's more and more younger people coming now and searching for something that is more valuable, that is more traditional, that can anchor them in their hearts. And I don't believe that we in the modern society cannot live in a modern way, but yet have roots in our heart. I can talk about myself. I am very rooted in my tradition. I feel my home is my tradition, my teaching. It's not a building or a place. But yet I do live a life that is modern. I, I live in a condominium in Singapore. I travel, I speak in English, uh, mostly. <laughs> I, I mean, I am, I am living a modern life. I use technology, but I use them to help me be rooted, to help me be supported in my heart. And I'm very sure that People can find that. And root is not only about a religion or uh, some kind of, you know, place or something like that. The roots can also be something like our own belief system, our value system, our morals, our ethics. And that is what we need to root ourselves. Ask ourselves the question, why are we existing here? 
Is it just to buy products and consume or is there some other reason why we are existing? You know, and that's what we have to ask. I mean, most modern societies, they have all the wealth. But what are we doing with the wealth to, to lift ourselves up or others up? Are we even doing that? We are not. Most people are consumers, like they just consume, but they're not making themselves become better people. So we need to ask ourselves this question. And this is a beautiful question to leave our audience to ponder upon after they have listened to our conversation here today. So I find that for any human being, it's a very, very powerful question to ask every day. What am I doing with my life? Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Karistu, for joining us today. It was truly a pleasure to have a conversation. And, and of course, for everyone who is curious and interested to learn more about uh, what you do and how to connect with you, we will include all information in the links. So please check our description in the podcast and YouTube video. And uh, subscribe to the show, share with friends, and we see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, man. Feel free to share this episode with friends, subscribe to the podcast and YouTube channel, and follow us on social media. And remember, you are the master of your own life. Mm-hmm.